Let's open in our Bibles to the 21st chapter of Luke. Luke 21 is Christ's message, which I like to call a survival guide to the tribulation. Jesus talks about the final holocaust that's coming on this planet, the ultimate, final, horrific end to the horrors of sin that have been building and growing and permeating this world. It comes to a climactic head, and it's called the tribulation, and it is it's very significant that this week, of all weeks, as I was meditating and praying and thinking and looking again at these scriptures, that the world soberly remembered, for the first time, by the way, for the United Nations, the entire world remembered and marked the Soviet Army's closure of Auschwitz, you know, the concentration camp where 1.2 million Jews were cremated at the rate of 2,000 a day uh, in that 40 square kilometer little death camp that was going on. So the whole world marked it, and you know all the media coverage, even making fun of our vice president for what he wore. But it's amazing that, that the world remembered Hitler's Holocaust, Hitler's final solution, his destruction of the Jewish people. Well, Jesus, in chapter 21, starting in verse 7, tells us about not the final solution of Hitler, but the final Holocaust of the world. What's amazing is it was just Europe that the original Holocaust was limited to. Uh, it was not safe to be in most of Europe if you were a Jewish person from 1939 to 1945. But in the tribulation, it's not merely Jews. It's the whole human race that is going to be affected. And it's not just the decimation and the genocide of one small people group, but it's the catastrophic global destruction, God says, of one half of all humans alive on this planet. Well, Jesus talks about to us this morning, his words are for us to draw lessons and to learn. And basically, uh, within this message amounts to what, what is for us 12 beautiful keys that Jesus gives, 12 steps to be prepared for the tribulation. Now you say, wait a minute, who's supposed to get ready? Well, he's talking here specifically to those who are going to be in the tribulation. These are Jewish believers and saints who are coming to Christ through the ministry of the evangelists that are described in the Bible, 144,000 invulnerable, unable to be killed, marked by God, Jewish evangelists. Then there's two more. They're called the two saints, two witnesses. They, they go throughout the whole earth. And the ministry of these 144,000 plus the two plus one more, an angel encircles the earth giving the eternal gospel. Through those 144 and 2 and 1, there are multitudes saved. And they have to exist on this planet during this final holocaust. So Jesus addresses them. And although the believers he's addressing are tribulation saints and Jewish believers and those who are saved through the evangelistic work of this group, the lessons have deep implications for us. Because what Jesus does, remember he tells this, this message, he gives this sermon three times. Actually, three versions. Jesus preached it once in the Mount of Olives. It's called the Olivet Discourse. It's in Mark 13, it's in Matthew 24, and it's in Luke 21. But each one of these messages, if you read them, are pointed toward almost a different audience. This one in Luke is pointed specifically toward the Gentiles for them to see. This isn't really oriented Jewishly, even though it's a message for Jewish people. And so what we see, Christ, right in the middle, throws in a little warning and tells people to think and to respond. And then at the end, he applies it to believers today. And that's why I'm taking it, even though I know that a lot of people say, we're not going to be here, we're going to escape, we're going to be in the rapture, who cares about the tribulation? God does. He cares so much, he gives a survival guide. And Jesus says that the elements that are going to be present in the tribulation hour are going to start before the tribulation hour. And we have just as much cause to be concerned that we not be deceived 
That we not be fearful. That we not be anxious as our world irresistibly is drawn toward that final hour. So let's learn some lessons for us this morning. Christ's words are a call for us to be ready at the onset of the worst time in history. It will begin theologically after Christ's church is removed from this world. That's the the compelling argument Paul gives for this. He says that the restraint of the Holy Spirit permeating the lives of the saints of God in his church is holding back this final holocaust. But when the control rods, as it were, believers, we absorb so much of, of, of what is wanting to be unleashed in this world by Satan, we absorb that through our godly salt and light in this world. But when we, as the control rods, are pulled out of this reactor, it's going to go to critical mass and melt down. But we are living in the last days. I'm thankful I can say that with certainty because it says in Hebrews 1, 2, the last days began when Christ proclaim the gospel on earth. And so the last days actually began 2,000 years ago. And if they began 2,000 years ago, we're later in the last days than, than they were then. And Paul was so anxiously looking for Christ's return. But the climate of the tribulation is already here. What we're going to see this morning, all of those elements are already here. In fact, this week, this week, some scientists in some secret location on this planet in a very high-tech laboratory for the first time ever combined human genetic material with that of an animal. And they are starting to form these animals that will grow human organs inside of them. Now this was reported in the National Geographic website because they think it's neat because it harkens back to mythology But I told Bonnie, I said, you know, the last time there was genetic engineering in the human race, God destroyed the entire world because he said, I will not allow you to tinker with immortal souls. I will not allow you to alter so they're no longer human and they're something else. You know that event that was called the flood of Noah. Because the angels were coming in and corrupting the human race and causing these half-human, half-demon creatures, God destroyed the earth. Everybody but eight people. You know, if you read the scriptures, you know he's going to destroy the earth again the next time that happens. This week, they succeeded in putting and fusing together human genetic material. It was only in a guinea pig but they did it. And they figure if they keep doing this in larger animals, they can grow spleens and livers and hearts and lungs inside these creatures and surgically remove them and cause humans to be able to have extended life because you can get a new anything. The last line of the National Geographic article was, it said, but what the the disturbing question that remains is what will happen if one of these animals begets something that looks human it said what would we do with that God says when you see the climate of the end coming get ready and so the tribulation may not be as far off as some people want to think and also it might be that we are not completely removed before the storms that precipitate the tribulation begin we might be living in those moral and geographic and climactic storms they're going to characterize the end so as people across the world mark the 60th anniversary of the liberation of the grizzly death camp complex known as Auschwitz the whole world focused briefly and the whole United Nations focused briefly on that event and so since Christ uses current events to illustrate future truth I thought if you listen to the news at all this week and heard about Auschwitz maybe you've thought about that maybe you've seen some of those images of those bodies stacked like cordwood as they didn't have enough time to burn them all up before the Soviet army came and they found all these bodies laid out inside the crematoriums Did you know 1.2 million Jews were, in a horrific way, executed in that little tiny six-mile by four-mile camp that was called Auschwitz? They killed them every way possible. They boiled them. They electrocuted them. They froze them to death. They kept cutting parts of them off till they died. They did everything they could think of. They were just just so hateful 
and demonic. And then they would, well, they gassed most of them, but they would burn them in these ovens. 1.2 million people died. The first person that died, died as a test with the gas. The last one died because the Soviet artillery was making it and they just turned off the ovens and turned off the gas chamber. And so the period that that thing operated was exactly three and a half years, exactly 42 months. I think that's significant if you know anything about Bible prophecy. Let me read to you what the secular newspaper said. Because Hitler's Holocaust, horrible as it was, murdering over six million Jews alone, pales when compared to the final Holocaust of Luke 21 that we're looking at this morning. If you watched the news this week, you saw images of what were often used to remind us of the final solution. Here's what the images we saw. The newscasters talked about the one and a half million people who died at Auschwitz, of whom 1.2 million were Jewish. That means one-fifth of all the six million Jews exterminated by Hitler died in that one little camp, six miles by four miles, called Auschwitz. Other groups of people also died, although very few in comparison to how many Jews died. Those that were also exterminated were Polish political prisoners, Soviet prisoners of war, gypsies, and people with disabilities and those who were rebels against the Third Reich. But mostly, 95 to 98% were Jewish people that were murdered. If you listen this week to the incredible comparison, you'll see what I mean. They compared this to a horrific world event. But I sat back and watched the figures. They said this, Auschwitz killed its first person on September 3rd, 1941. When they opened the gas chamber, stuck in a poor unsuspecting person, they said they were going to debug them, de-louse them, and they shut the door and they cranked up the little hairdryer thing that went on these crystals that produced this gas and immediately the person convulsed and vomited and died. Then they had fired up the ovens and they tossed them in there and saw how quickly they could cremate them. And immediately the German engineering minds calculated that they could do 2,000 cremations a day if they left the oven on 24 hours a day. So they began bringing railroad cars of Jewish people. The last person was cremated on January 27, 1945. That was exactly 1,242 days or 42 months or three and a half years. 1.2 million Jews died. Now, here's the comparison. Most scholars see the first half of the seven-year period of the tribulation, the final period of earth's history, to be relatively normal. It's the second half that seems to have the incredible destruction, demon armies, and death. So in Bible times, theologically, the great tribulation lasts three and a half years or 42 months. It appears that the, the leader of the whatever it, form it takes, the Western coalition, the European common market, or the European Union, or the organized Western civilizations, whatever it is, the leader of that, which we know in the Bible by over two dozen different names, most notably the Antichrist, that world leader seems to protect the Jews until the middle point of that seven years. Auschwitz opened its doors to death by gas chamber on September 3rd, 1941. The advance of the Soviet army closed the camp on January 27th. The death camp of the Holocaust was operating three and a half years or 42 months. So if you know anything about history, there is a recognizable period of time that you can think about. Let's compare the horrors of Auschwitz and the Holocaust with what's coming, okay? The only comparison is the length of time, okay? Everything else breaks down after that. So the death camp at Auschwitz and the Great Tribulation last almost exactly the same length of time. But that's where the comparison stops. The final Holocaust is so terrifying, so deadly, so inescapable, that God personally has to step in to stop it. Or not one single human being would have been left alive on this planet. That's how bad it gets. You see, the first Holocaust, Hitler's Holocaust, was limited to continental Europe, and not even all of Europe, because the Allies were there. And it was limited to gypsies, a few Poles, a few Soviets, and Jews. They could be rounded up. The final Holocaust 
is every human being as a target. If they're not a target of the hailstones and of the scorching sun. In fact, the book of Revelation says, and I don't want you to turn there because I want to stay in Luke, but it says, starting in Revelation 6, 8, that one out of every two people will die, some through the ravages of war, others by starvation, amazingly, every, uh, many others by what are called the beasts of the earth. And I told you many years ago that Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the man who invented or perfected the microscope, the first time he looked through it at a little drop of pond water, said, what amazing beasties. He called the little microscopic organisms beasts. It's interesting. That's the same period of time that the Elizabethan English of the King James Bible called those creatures that destroy so many hundreds of millions of people beasts of the earth could very possibly most likely be microorganisms such as the horrific biological warfare laboratories that are producing pathogens all over the world well so whether by death that comes instantly and less dreaded or a slow and painful death that is lingering and agonizing 50 percent of all people on the earth will die the world's population yesterday when i looked online was six billion four hundred fifteen million five hundred seventy four thousand one hundred seventy six so if that population holds when the tribulation starts that means that 3.2 billion people will die in 42 months. How many is that? Well, if you just take your spreadsheet, if you add it up, it means that 79 million will die every month. Two and a half million will die every day. Auschwitz only managed with their ovens running 24-7 they only managed to kill 1.2 million Jews. The tribulation is going to see 2.5 million people die every day. Two and a half million a day for 42 months. As I said when I mentioned that last time in the tsunami, how are they going to bury all those bodies? How are they going to bury the equivalent to 11 times the population of the United States that are going to die? God says, not the UN, not, not the prophetic conference, the Bible says half the population of the world will die in that short period of time. It's an unbelievable thing to think about. In the Great Tribulation, two and a half million die every day for 42 months. In Auschwitz, less than a thousand died each day. That means 2,500 times as many people will die every day during the Tribulation. Or to put it in Auschwitz terms, the number of people that died every day at Auschwitz will die every 30 seconds around the planet. In other words, every 30 seconds, a thousand people will be dying. Every 30 seconds, a thousand people will be dying. And that will go on endlessly it will be like living in a death camp to be on this planet during that time that's not all that's happening not just will 11 times the population of the united states if you can imagine that perish but one third of all living creatures the vegetables and also the the things the the vegetation the creatures in the sea all grass every tree everything green revelation 8 7 says a third of all that will be destroyed not just the people but the plants the sun and moon will be dark and nature goes into revolt. The gates of hell. I mean, if it isn't bad enough to, to have climactic changes and to have stuff burning up and have people dying, it says in Revelation 9 that God will open the gates of hell and hordes of these locust creatures the size of horses will come on the earth and they will be allowed to sting men like scorpions and the pain of one sting will last five months and the Bible says people will beg God to let them die and he won't let them die and they will be screaming and writhing and everybody will be wondering where the next horse-sized monster is going to come crashing in and sting them there'll be a worldwide famine like nothing the world has ever seen that's revelation 18 8 there will be a world war so bloody that the blood of those killed in battle flows 200 miles and it will splash as high as a horse's bridle so we're talking about four feet high splashes can you imagine next time you walk through a mud puddle 
do what a kid does and splash it and see how hard and how much water you have to have to have it splashed to be four feet high. That's how much blood will cover the ground at that final battle. All told during the Great Tribulation, as many as half of all the people on the earth will be killed. Now you see why God refers to what he plans for the church as the blessed hope. That's why Paul shared that with those suffering. And that's why it is such a blessed hope. It's because the tribulation is so horrible. So that means that true believers who are born again this morning will escape everything, right? Yes, exactly. That's what the Bible says. We will miss every part of the tribulation, but we will probably go through some of the world's darkest days. It will be the darkest before the storm starts it's ever been, and that's where we're headed. And we don't know the day or the hour he's coming. And so all the elements that I'm going to point out to you right now in Luke 21 are ones that are the survival guide for the people that find themselves inside the tribulation, but they're a great preparation for us on the other side. For us who have to be here right until it starts. And it's a wonderful lesson Jesus gives us. In Luke 21, we see the end of everyone's life as it was. Time stops, life ends, nothing is the same again. Christ's coming, at the end of that, will simply reveal what people really were. Well, let's look at Christ's 12-step survival guide to them and to us. And what I'd like you to do is turn to the end, and that's what we're going to start with, and that's verse 36. And I want you to really think about this, because these are Luke 21, 36 is Christ's address to us, okay? You follow along in your Bible, and I'm going to read it. Jesus says, watch, therefore, that means don't get hypnotized. Watch, therefore, and pray always. We saw that word pray is that unique word, that oh my, which means to beg. Beg God that you may be counted worthy to escape all those things that are coming. That means, if you want to put it into 2005 language, you better make sure you're really saved this morning. Make sure that you've said that God so loved me, not just the world, me, that he gave his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that because I believe in him, I will not perish, but I have everlasting life. Make sure, Jesus said, that you're counted worthy by his grace and through his mercy to escape these things which will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Let's bow and ask the Lord to open his word to us. Father in heaven, thank you that we can look at your word. It's so relevant. The world marked Auschwitz. We marked this morning the final Holocaust. We thank you that we know you, and those who know you will be kept from that hour, but Lord, there's a world around us that does not know you. And I pray that we would see from this survival guide how we can be more effective witnesses in the days leading up to the end. And Lord, until you come or call, may we be your good and faithful servants, counted worthy to someday stand before you and to hear you say, well done. You were a good servant to me. I left you on earth to obey and to do what I left you to do, and you did it. Help us to know what you want us to do and to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The dangers Jesus warned of, starting in verse 8, are what the church has faced from the beginning. There have always been deceiving teachers. There has always been persecution. There have always been disasters. In fact, I was, I was just reading... Wesley's sermon in, in the Sunday after the gigantic tsunami hit Portugal. There was an earthquake out in the ocean and a gigantic wave like we saw on Christmas Day and following crashed into Portugal and the earthquake fol- or preceding it and then the wave that followed it and it totally destroyed their cities all along the harbors of Portugal along the Atlantic coast. And, and Wesley was preaching a sermon about the second coming of Christ, and it was interesting that he used Luke 21 as his text, and he says we ought to learn from the earthquake in Lisbon and the tsunami of 17, whatever it was, 21 or 41. He says we ought to learn from that what the end of the world is like. That's because there's always been disasters. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been tsunamis. We're not supposed to go out and say that's the one that means we're in the end. What we're supposed to do is to say how does God want us to live if we are in the end? And that's what Luke 21 is. And basically Jesus says this in verse 8. He says, there will be religious deception. 
But look what he says. Take heed that you not be deceived. What does Jesus say? Be not deceived. We must take it to heart. He says that there is going to be a deceiving work of the devil that's going to increase more than ever before in the last days. And part of it is going to be to take away from the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and the uniqueness of the way of salvation. And that's what Paul said. He says many are going to come in that day and they're going to say that there there are many ways to God. And he says don't listen to the deception. And that's what we have today. I don't know if you realize that even you sitting in this church has marked you. We're known in Tulsa as being exclusivists as far as the gospel goes. There are many people who don't like you to say that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. And people don't like the exclusivity of Christ. They want to demean him. They want to demote him. They want to put him with others. They want to say he is not God or that he is not supernatural, that he is not sinless or that whatever, or he needs something else. But they just don't like the fact that he's the only way. And so he says, Jesus Christ says in verse 8, don't be deceived. Well, what's the first step of the survival guide? Well, I, I call survival guide step one. I will know the word of God so I won't be deceived. Let me ask you this. If, you, if they marched in here with a bus and they hauled us all off to some prison camp somewhere and you didn't have anything of all of your notes and paraphernalia and all of your books and all of your libraries and all of your favorite Christian radio and tapes and CDs and television and church to go to, how much doctrinal truth do you know? Even more important, how much of God's word is written on your heart? I just stood at the bedside of a dear saint this week who we thought was dying imminently. And there in the ICU with hushed tones, they ushered me in. I sat next to her and Bonnie and I, and we talked to her. And she had the big, huge respirator thing down her throat. It was just an amazing sight. And, you know, she just couldn't talk, but she just, well, she did talk. She pulled the whole thing off and said, sing blessed assurance to me. I thought, wow. She even sat up. I I I thought you were dying. You know, she sat right up, said, sing blessed assurance to me. And the whole time we sang, she kept pointing and saying, Jesus is mine. And as I read the scripture, I watched her. As I read favorite scripture, her mouth moving along with us. As we sang, her mouth was moving along. And you know what I saw in that that 80-year-old body? I saw someone who the word of God was written on her heart. She knew the words. She knew the verses. She knew the words of the song. She didn't need her Bible in that ICU room. She had it with her in her heart. How much do you have if it was taken away right now you didn't have another bible you didn't have another another christian song nothing no tape how much do you know you know that's when you need it most is at the end when you when you're so strapped down and tubed up and punctured and everything that you can't do anything that's when it's neat to have a lot of the scripture written on your heart so you can think about the one who promised you so much and promised me so much Number one, I will know God's word, so I will not be deceived. You need to know God's word so that no matter who preaches to you. Do you remember when Paul preached in Acts 17, in verse 11? What did the Bereans do? They said, great sermon, Paul. We're going to go home and check it out in the scriptures. I mean, he was writing the Bible. And they said, God will always agree with himself, and we're going to see that your message you just preached to us lines up with the scriptures. And if it does, we accept it. We've lost that nowadays. Nowadays, if your favorite teacher says it, you believe it. You can't prove it. You can't find it yourself in the Bible. You don't even know where he got it from. But if he said it, you believe it. And that's why we have so many denominations and so many divisions in the church, because everyone's following someone instead of everyone following the living and abiding Word of God. Most people couldn't defend themselves out of a wet paper bag doctrinally. They couldn't because they don't know the Bible. They know what they've been taught all their life. They know what they said in their denomination or in their group or their sect or whatever, but they don't know what God says. Step number one, I will know the word of God, so I won't be deceived. Now there is a place for the teaching the word of God, and that's what I'm doing this morning, but there is a responsibility on your side of knowing and examining and finding and sorting through and holding fast to 
what God's Word says. Second verse I want to show you is verse 9. Because there's also going to be global distress. He says, when you hear of wars and commotions, don't be terrified. The second thing Christ says is, don't be anxious. And we ought to take it to heart. I mean, I see people living in constant anxiety. I mean, they're anxious about, it's going to snow. It's going to ice. Or, you know, we're going to have, you know, Americans going to lay off more people. Or, or the dollar's dropping. Yes, all those things are going to happen. And worse. I mean, if you're following prophecy, the Bible says that the kings of the East are going to be the major players in the end. In fact, the historic word for China is the word that Isaiah uses when he talks about the tribulation. I mean, it's almost for certain China is the ascending power coming this week. The Central Bank of China didn't do it, but they began making sounds that they're going to detach the Chinese currency from the dollar. Now that's going to cause an amazing effect on our world. There are trillions of dollars out there. And everybody thinks those dollars are worth so much because they're pegged to different currencies. Now, not anytime soon. Don't get rid of your dollars. But the tribulation does not see us as the, as the superpower. It sees Europe. It sees China. It sees the Islamic countries. It doesn't see us. So something we should think about is not to be anxious. Survival guide number two. I will trust God's promises so I won't live in a fearful life. You don't have to worry about how to best protect your money. Give it to the Lord. I don't mean you have to put it in the offering plate. I mean consciously say, God, all I have belongs to you. So it's not any longer my car that I have to worry about that someone's going to steal or break into or get my stereo out of. It's yours. And it's no longer my house that I have to worry about having the finest security system and a gun in my dresser drawer and, you know, and locks and bars. It's your house. It's no longer my retirement plan that I've got to stay awake all night moving it between funds to make sure that, that I'm in a growth one so that I'll have enough at the end. But I say, Lord, it's yours. You know, there is the most peaceful life possible of knowing that we're just stewards of someone else's stuff you know a lot of ulcers and a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety comes from me trying to guard my stuff and God says it's not your stuff it's mine why don't you give it back to me and take no thought for the morrow what you shall eat what you shall wear etc etc but seek first the kingdom of God, God ruling in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your job, in your finances, in your time. Seek first that. And he said, I'll add everything else to you. Survival guide number two, I'll trust God's promises so I won't live a fearful life. Number three, look at verse 13. Here's the third element. There's going to be religious persecution. He talks about it in the verses that I skipped over and personal persecutions. And what does Christ say? He says, don't be afraid. Verse 13, it will turn out for an occasion for a testimony. Therefore, settle in your hearts to meditate not beforehand what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Don't be all afraid and and worried about what you're going to say when you're confronted because of your love for Jesus Christ. Jesus says, be not afraid. It's his admonition to us, and we have to take it to heart. You know what we should do is what verse 13 says, and that's the third step of the survival guide that Jesus lays down. I will speak for Jesus in any circumstance. He says, don't worry. I will give you, verse 15, a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You know, I have a real good friend who tells me, I love it every time your printer breaks down and you come on Sunday night and you don't have your notes. I don't usually tell you that, but you know, that happens from time to time. And he says, it's always the best sermon. Because he says, you just speak from your heart. Did you know that's what Jesus is saying? He's saying, don't be afraid when they haul you in before the magistrate or the court or whatever. And you have to to explain what you believe. Because he says, I will give you an answer. You know what that means? You can try that out this week. Stand up for the Lord. And say, Lord, I will speak for you in any circumstance. In fact, the book of Acts, the apostles got roughed up. They hauled them in, remember, imprisoned them and threatened and warned them and everything, and then they let them go. And they went 
back to see the believers. And it says this in Acts 4.31. When they prayed, the place they were assembled was shaken. They were all filled with Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Emphasis filled with the Holy Spirit. Our job is to make sure that we are emptied of self so that God can fill every part of our life. I already have all of God. The problem is he doesn't have all of me. And I would assume that's your problem too. We all have to be constantly surrendering more areas of our lives. We all have to be giving all of ourself, our attention, our mind, our affections, our desires, our hopes and dreams, our, our secret desires, all to him so he can fill everything. And the more filled we are with the Lord and his spirit, the more that he gives us a boldness. Tribulation survival guide point three, I will speak for Jesus in any circumstance. Uh, look at, at uh, verse 16. You'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Wow. Hey, this is pre-tribulation, by the way. This is what the church has gone through. This is, the, this is what's going on everywhere outside of our country, basically, in the world. People are being betrayed. They're being sold out. They are being horrifically, I mean, read the Voice of the Martyrs publication. It's free, and it's from right up the road, and you can get it from right, I mean, it's a local ministry in Bartlesville. Just read one edition and see the scars, the burns, the beatings that believers are getting because verse 16 is going on right now. They're betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You know what the fourth point of our survival guide is? I will purpose to never quit even when those closest to me fail me. You can pour your life into someone for a long time and they can completely turn, betray you. We have to purpose. We're going to follow the Lord. Lord, in the parallel passage in Mark 13, he says, you'll be hated of all for my name's sake. Wow. All that are godly are going to suffer. That's the promise of the word of God. So I'm not going to quit. Look at verse 17. He says, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. I expect, fifth point, life is going to be hard and full of trials. Right now, it doesn't harm us to be a Christian. When I used to work in Eastern Europe and take Bibles in in the 70s and the early 80s, a Christian living in Eastern Europe behind the, the Iron Curtain could not go to the best university unless they stepped away from their testimony of faith in Christ. In fact, you couldn't go to any professional. You could not get any doctoral level training as a born-again Christian in the Soviet bloc and in the, the uh, Eastern Europe. European nations. You consciously, when you came to Christ, lost your privilege of advancement. Now let me ask you, if the big schools say, now we don't want any of this, this exclusivism, unless you will say there are many ways and not just Christ, unless you'll say that, that it's okay to be homosexual and that, that a murder of the unborn is okay and they start tagging doctrines that the Bible is clear on and they say you're going to have to not believe those things to come into our higher education all of a sudden we're going to realize that there is a cost you know right now you can be successful in America and a Christian but would you still want to be a Christian if you couldn't be successful if you couldn't send your children to good schools if your children had to be ditch diggers, that's what the Christians were in Eastern Europe. All the believers I met with and delivered Bibles to were brilliant people that had lowly laboring jobs in the Soviet structure because they were believers. And they had calloused hands and they had bent backs and they had brilliant minds and full hearts and they said we take joyfully the spoiling of our goods because we belong to Christ what, what's the survival guide I will expect that life is going to be hard and full of trials I'm going to expect that I'm not going to think that I'm going to have an easy life and that I'm going to have a secure life and I'm going to have financial independence and financial security that's why the church was so strong in Eastern Europe and the Soviet bloc nations do you know why they paid a price to be believers just two more verses. Verse 18, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. Six point of the 12 points of Christ's survival guide, I will trust Jesus with my fears about physical death. Did you know that one of the great tools of the devil is to make us afraid 
Every time we get a pain, every time we get a, uh, some kind of a something that, that isn't working, we go, ah, ah, I might die, which is far better. Did you know I say that all the time? People come to me and say, ah, someone is sick and they might die, and I said, which is far better. They just, especially if it's a relative. What's wrong with you? We want them to get well. I say, but don't forget that to be absent to body is present with the Lord and it's far better. But God will let us stay here as long as it's needful. That's what the Bible says. So instead of desperately cranking up every possible mechanism to extend life, we say to die is far better. And I'm not afraid to die. And God has appointed a day. Psalm 139 says, Every day of my life is written in his book. And it says in Hebrews 9 that he has set an appointment for me once to die. And I cannot hasten and I cannot retard that. I cannot hold it off and I cannot speed it up. What I can do is redeem the time between right now and whenever that appointment is. And so, number six, I will trust Jesus with my fears about physical death. Because, Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He will lead me beside the still waters. Why? Because even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. Because the same one that's been with me through life will be with me through death. So how do we get ready for the tribulation? For the storms before the storm? Number one, I will know God's word so well that I won't be deceived. And number two, I will trust God's promises so much I won't live in fear of even temporary little things. And number three, I will speak for Jesus in any circumstance. Wow, will he be happy for that. He's got us on this earth, and most Christians are like secret agents. They're like the Mossad. Nobody knows who they are. They're just out there. And they're, whole, they're, they're a mole, you know, underground. No, he wants us to speak up. I mean, all the wackos speak up. Why can't we who know the truth declare it for Christ? Number four, I will purpose to never quit even when those closest to me fail me. Number five, I will expect life is going to be hard and full of trials. And, and so when the bumps start coming, I'm not going to, I'm going to say, wow, I'm being refined. I, I'm getting, coming like gold. Number six, I will trust Jesus with my fears about physical death. You know, the last one is what we're going to go with. Look at verse 19. By your patience, possess your souls. This is a fascinating construction. You know what it basically means? I'm going to give my emotion into Christ's care and live in the peace that he promised me. Someone says, "Um, what do you mean by being peaceful? I have had to learn that this scripture is true, I can give my emotions into Christ's care so I can live in the peace he gave to me. Do you? Do you, when, when you're overwhelmed, your spirit is overwhelmed within you, do you say, Lord, lead me to the rock that's higher than I am? Lead me into your tower of refuge. Lead me into your fortress. My soul is cleaving to the dust. Quicken me according to your word. It's nothing magical. It's nothing other than faith in the one who said, "In by your patience, possess your souls. Don't allow your emotions to cripple you. Jesus said, I want to control your feelings by having them fixed on me. Are you ready for the final holocaust? The first step is, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved. But once you've done that, it's this survival guide. Let's bow together. Father, thank you for the world marking the first Holocaust. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for preaching this sermon about the final Holocaust. Thank you that we know ahead of time that this world is going to be a death camp with thousands dying every second. But Lord... You've left us here to influence as many people as we can with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and to live such lives that the world looks at us and takes note of us and knows that we are those who are with you and you are with us. We believe, help our unbelief, capture our minds, help us to realize we're just passing through and that you want us to give all we are to you, to use for your glory until you come or call. 
Help us in that mind to be ready for whatever comes, to speak for you, to believe in you, to trust you, to give our emotions to you, and to find our security in Christ, in Christ alone, in whose precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.